Hi, very good morning. I'm Dr. Janak Patel. I'm a general physician. Today we'll be discussing on one of the very interesting topic we call as a dizziness, mainly regarding vertigo, presyncope, differences between these two groups or we call vertigo and non-vertiginous dizziness groups. So dizziness or we call vertigo, dizziness is enough to make you head spins. So we'll be dealing with approach to dizziness or we call difference between vertigo and non-vertigo conditions. Dizziness is a term used to describe everything from a person feels that as if he is going to faint, light headache, feeling weak, unsteady, rotating sensation or a spinning sensation. If you go through the different condition which produces a dizziness, out of 100 cases of dizziness, almost true what I go are more than 50%. Pre-syncope or syncope is around 25%. Ataxia accounts for a very small group, 2%. And light headache, which is very commonly because of drugs, particularly sedatives, tranquilizers, cup syrups, antihistaminics, or a person might have because of hypoglycemia and psychogenic causes, which accounts for 25% of the cases. Indirectly, what I go is the most common cause of dizziness in everyday practice. Person feels this way. Person can describe a dizziness as light headache, blackouts, giddiness, numbness, faintness, confusion, syncope, claustrophobia, or person can call imbalance or I am out of it. All these are different description of dizziness. Or person also complains of sense of strangeness. Something funny is going on. Usually this is a typical vertigo, what we call. You can see that. This is the typical description. Something is rotating. Or he is rotating. So vertigo is a specific term. Includes only vertigo. And it is more common in an elderly person. While dizziness is a broad term which includes vertigo and non-vertiginous conditions like syncope, ataxia, presyncope, and we call psychogenic causes also. So vertigo, the main complaint is spinning or illusion of something is spinning. And presyncope means feeling as if he will become faint, feeling of fainting attacks. While disequilibrium means unsteadiness while walking, feeling as if the lower limb is unsteady. And light headache is very commonly because of medication, psychiatric disorders, anxiety, depression, panic attacks, hyperventilations, those groups. Among what I got, the most common cause is BPPV, Minia syndromes, labyrinthitis. These three accounts for the topmost on the list. BPPV, Minia, labyrinthitis, and we call vestibular. BB territory ischemia. That will be included in the central causes. We'll be dividing those particular as we bypass. While presyncope, we'll be also dealing with that. Vasovagal, cardiac and cardiac arrhythmias, postural hypotensions, structural heart disease, those particular groups. And disequilibrium mainly because of peripheral neuropathy, we call sensory ataxia, or because of cerebellum, cerebellar ataxia, or because of vestibular apparatus damage, we call vestibular ataxia. So we have already told you what I go is accounting for more than 50% Pre-syncope, syncope, almost 25%. And we call psychiatric groups accounting for almost 15%. Ataxia is 2%.
and when we can't identify the cause, we put them into idiopathic group, which is accounting for 10%. So these are the common groups which are the commonest causes as far as vertigo is concerned. So in vertigo, the person is complaining of spinning attacks, presyncope, person will say that he is impending to faint, disequilibrium, unsteadiness while walking, off balance and other vague complaints, difficulty to describe, floating sensation, light headache, etc. So vertigo is a sense of imbalance where person says there is an illusion of motion interpreted as a self movement or environmental movements. There is a rotating sensation with spinning sense of falling or swaying back to and fro or merry go round effects. This is either objective or subjective and person will have a sense of imbalance. While in ataxia, disequilibrium mainly seen in postural instability and person will get imbalance during walking or while posture. While in pre syncope the person will say that I am about to faint or nearly fainting or nearly blackouts which last for a few seconds very frequently with orthostatic hypotension, cardiac arrhythmias, vasovagal attacks, etc. There is an impending feeling of fainting or becoming unconscious. It is usually temporary phenomena. The person will have associated symptoms like sweating, pallor, etc. So this is the common things which will you see in a pre -synco. While in a syncope, person will lose consciousness. So there will be loss of consciousness, which is sudden, relatively sudden, lasting for few seconds only, for very short period, self-terminating. And it recovers completely. There is no post-ictal phase. And person do not require any medical or surgical intervention. And it is mainly because of inadequate cerebral perfusion. Most of them is triggered by a fall in a systemic arterial pressure. Psychogenic, usually person will not be able to describe properly. He will have a lot of different types of symptoms like floating sensation, funny sensation, light headache, etc. which does not fit with either vertigo or pre syncope or with ataxia. Very commonly seen in hyperventilation, anxiety, depression, or substance abuse, etc. Now, once a person is decided, is complaining of dizziness, you will have to approach to that particular person to find out the cause of vertigo. So, in step one, first find out whether it is vertigo or not. If a person is having headache, mental stress, person is complaining of a light headache, unusual complaints, palpitations, think in terms of a non-vertigo conditions. Once it is from history you suspect vertigo, then you try to identify type of vertigo whether it is central or peripheral. Then try to confirm the diagnosis of vertigo, that is step 3 etiology and then you decide regarding the treatment part of it. Nutan When a patient says that I am dizzy, you first ask a question, what do you mean by dizzy? Does room spin? So if a person is having a spinning feeling, it is more in favor of vertigo. Does your leg get weak? It is more in favor of ataxia. Do you feel that as if you might stagger? Then it is more in favor of pre or person says that I am about to faint. And if a person is saying light headache, neck, it is more in favor of psychogenic groups. So if a person says that room is spinning, 
or something is spinning around him it is more in favor of vertigo then you try to find out whether it is because of visual whether it is because of vestibular and if it is vestibular peripheral central etc so in a vestibular vertigo sensation of spinning while in a case of a non vestibular vertigo person will say the footing sensation swaying sensation rocking sensation which is very commonly because of visual or maybe psychogenic but if a person said that i am about to fall and i do, cannot maintain my balance it is more in favor of ataxia falling sensation unstable which is very commonly because of either cerebellar ataxia sensory ataxia or because of vestibular ataxia in a peris in co person will complain of fainting at episodes and very frequently it is because of cardiovascular system or vasovagal so if a person says that i am going to faint or i am giddy or i am having a light headed dizzy think in terms of a syncope or near syncope and that is very commonly because of orthostatic hypotension cardiac arrhythmias hypersensitive carotid sinus vasovagal syncope or maybe because of structural heart disease etc you try to differentiate from that group we'll be going through that as we pass on the different slides and if a person says that i am about to fall while walking or while having a particular posture then it is more in favor of disequilibrium or we call as ataxia which can be cerebellar can be because of sensory or can be because of even vestibular also why a person who feels something is tilting or rocking or room is spinning we call objective or subjective it can be because of peripheral vertigo or can be because of central vertigo peripheral vertigo is mainly because of the vestibular apparatus involvement so it is vestibular neuronitis or vestibulitis or maybe meniere's or maybe bppv but person says i am just dizzy cannot describe properly ill defined light headedness mainly rule out psychiatric disorders like anxiety depressions etc and sometime it can be because of even sedative tranquilizers hypoglycemia etc so same thing if a person says i am feeling surroundings spinning more in favor of what i go i might fall i might lose balance ataxia i feel i'll faint or i am giddy pre syncope or if a person says that i experienced dizziness and then i fainted likely to be syncope you can ask a leading questions like do you get feeling of rotation or does the surrounding spin around you more in favor of vertigo unsteadiness ataxia fainting episodes or person says that i would faint pre syncope and if the person says i lose consciousness after the episode more in favor of syncope so first you have to differentiate between a true vertigo and a non vertigo conditions in a true vertigo conditions we have already mentioned that person will feel as if he is rotating or surrounding is rotating we call subjective or objective rotation so it can be peripheral it can be center so you have to differentiate that particular things we'll be going through that in a few next slides and try to differentiate a non rotatory vertigo which can be drug induced can be because of cardiovascular system or can be because of non specific condition like psychiatric groups so you try to differentiate between those groups and among the true vertigo you will have to differentiate between bppv meniere's vestibular neuronitis and labyrinthitis usually in a bppv the duration is few seconds and it is mainly related to position while in meniere's person will have a hearing disturbance he'll complain of tinnitus heaviness as well as it will be gradually progressive very commonly seen in a older age groups 
rather than younger age groups while in a vestibular neuronitis and bacterial labyrinthitis again you can have a little hyperacusis or person will say tinnitus ringing sounds in vestibular neuronitis or neuritis it is very commonly after urti upper respiratory tract infection while bacterial labyrinthitis is very commonly associated with ear discharge otitis media very common so what i go sometime can be associated with a migraine attacks so if it is associated with a migraine attack we call vertiginous migraine and if the person has got a hearing loss then it is more in favor of what we call as a peripheral vertigo episodic vertigo in minious disease or maybe labyrinthitis and if person says no hearing disturbance then it is in favor of bppv you can perform the dix help i maneuver and you can identify and if it is constant and there is no hearing disturbance it is more in favor of a vestibular you should understand vestibular is for balance and labyrinthitis is for what we call as hearing part so if there is a hearing disturbance labyrinthitis if there is no hearing disturbance it is more in favor of vestibular neuronitis so this is a simple thing by asking a simple question if the person said that he has got a little hearing disturbance on one side which is temporary usually it will be more in favor of labyrinthitis and if the person says no hearing disturbance but he has got vertigo it is more in favor of neuronitis these are some of the condition which are non vertiginous dizziness or we call pseudo vertigo which can be because of cardiac condition orthostatic hypotension metabolic condition like hypoglycemia hyperventilation drugs sedatives etc even in case of anemia also or maybe because of alcohol amino glycosides etc these are called as a pseudo vertigo means the person feels dizzy but it is not because of the vestibular or peripheral nerve what we call as a vestibular cochlear nerve involvement this is one slide you can go at your leisure time if the person says that there is a loss of consciousness if answer is yes you should try to rule out the causes of syncope if the answer is no try to rule out what is true what i go if the person says that he is having rotational feelings or surrounding is rotating it is in favor of a true what i go if the answer is no try to rule out other groups that is other causes of dizziness and if it is a true what i go then try to find out whether it is central or peripheral then if the what i go is precipitated by sudden head movements if it is the answer is yes it is more in favor of what we call as a bppv then you can perform a dix helpic maneuver and confirm the diagnosis if there is no hearing loss then it is more in favor of a vestibular neuronitis other condition other than vestibular neuronitis if the answer is yes and person is having tinnitus if answer is yes then it is in favor of what we call as otitis conditions middle ear disorders if answer is yes go for a bacterial labyrinthitis group if answer is no it is more in favor of what we call as minious disease and if the person is got tinnitus and if the answer is no then it is in favor of a acoustic neuromas this is roughly you can proceed with this this is a better one what we call as if clinical history is in favor of vertigo 
take a good history and good physical examination. You can go for a central or peripheral vertigo. We'll be having in a second. If it is not clear, look for the blood pressure in lying and supine posture. Lying posture or we call supine posture. And then take a blood pressure in standing posture. If there's a fall of blood pressure more than 20 millimeter, it is straightforward orthostatic hypotension. Look at the pulse. If it is irregular, more in favor of cardiac arrhythmias. Look at the neurological examination. If there is something abnormality in a neurological examination, it is more in favor of a cerebrovascular stroke or multiple sclerosis. If CNS examination is absolutely normal, look at the cervical spine. And if the vertigo is induced by position, then it is BPPV. Ask the history of recent vir viral illness. If answer is yes, labyrinthitis. If answer is no, ask history of drugs, antibiotics, diuretic, chemotherapy. If answer is yes, toxic labyrinthitis, drug-induced labyrinthitis. If answer is no, ask a history of trauma. Then it will be barotrauma or a head trauma. And if person is having hearing loss, if answer is yes, consult ENT person and try to identify the this different conditions. And if answer is no, is what I go for severe intensity? If answer is yes, again try to identify meniere's acoustic neuroma, toxic labyrinthitis, bacterial labyrinthitis, or other causes which produces damage to vestibular apparatus. So try to identify. What I go is an illusion of the movements of patient himself or surroundings. It is usually described as a rotatory, spinning, tilting, or swaying. Associated complaint is most common is nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, may have a ataxia, that is disequilibrium, and even you can find out nystagmus good number of time. By and large, very commonly, they are horizontal nystagmus. In a case of a central vertigo or central damage, you can have a vertical nystagmus. And disturbances in peripheral nervous system may be associated with a person of ataxia. True vertigo, there is an illusion of the self movements. If the person says that objects are moving, environment is moving, it is called as oscillopsia or objective vertigo. And if the person said that he, is, he feels as if he is swaying, then it is called pulsion or subjective. So true vertigo is defined as an illusion or hallucination of the movement. In both vertigo and disequilibrium, there is a loss of balance. But pure vertigo will involve the sense of motion. You can divide into central variety and peripheral variety. Central variety is because of the damage to the brainstem of cerebellum. While peripheral variety is because of the damage to the labyrinth or because of vestibular apparatus. And this we divide into two groups, subjective and objective variety, depending upon the symptoms. The person can have a rotatory feeling or a non-rotatory type of vertigo. Or we call subjective or objective variety. Or it can be spontaneous or can be induced by movements. Usually, if it is induced by a particular posture, it is more in favor of BPP. Central vertigo, the most common cause is a CP angle tumor, cerebrovascular disease, particularly we call as vertebrobasilar artery, VB territory disorder, cerebrovascular disease. Also, it can be one part and partial of a vertiginous migraine or in a case of a multiple sclerosis. While peripheral vertigo, the three classical groups, acute labyrinthitis, BPPV, minus. This three stands topmost on the list. And then comes vestibular neuritis. So these are the causes, most common causes as far as the central and peripheral vertigo is concerned. So in a vestibular variety, we can have peripheral vertigo, central vertigo, and sometimes we have got a mixture of the picture we call intermediate variety. In a non-vestibular variety, it can be because of the ocular or maybe because of miscellaneous conditions. Now, very peculiarity. In a central variety, person may be having altered level of consciousness to a person can become 
fully unconscious. Very frequently they complain of headaches, seizures, nausea, vomiting. They will have some neurological symptoms and signs, particularly of a brainstem damage or cerebellar signs, may have a cranial no palsy and symptom signs suggestive of a raised intracranial pressure or even a symptom signs suggestive of an intracranial pathology like meningeal signs, etc. While in case of a peripheral vertigo, it can be objective or a subjective feeling from a history. Nausea vomiting is present. You can have a prostration, tinnitus, hyperacusis, paraacusis. Person might have a hearing disturbance, earache, we call otalgia, or may have a ear discharge. This is very easy to differentiate from central vertigo. That is tinnitus, hyperacusis, nausea vomiting, no symptom signs of neurological damage, no seizures, no headache, no altered level of consciousness. That is a very clear way to differentiate from central with periphery. So if we put together, now onset in peripheral is usually sudden while in central it is gradual and progressive. Usually in peripheral it is recurrent and episodic while in central it is constant and progressively increasing with additional neurological symptoms and signs. Peripheral is usually for few seconds to a minutes while in a central it lasts very long for weeks and months. Nystagmus will be usually horizontal in case of peripheral while it is vertical in case of a central variety or it can be even rotatory variety. Triggered by movement, yes, if vertigo is triggered by head rotation, it is very much in favor of a peripheral vertigo rather than a central vertigo. Isolated hearing loss is very frequent in a case of a peripheral, that is we call it a unilateral disturbance. Neurological findings are very common. Tympanic membrane is usually affected or may be abnormal, may be there may be a hole, ear discharge, etc. in case of a peripheral, while tympanic membrane is usually absolutely normal in case of a central vertigo. Person will complain of easy fatigue in peripheral, while in central usually no. Associated symptom signs, tinnitus, nausea, vomiting, while in case of a central variety, neurological symptom signs, etc. are very, very common. Postural instability usually leads towards the side of the damage on the that side while in a central variety yes that is very frequently postural instability you will have a rhombus sign positive as well as other signs which will tell you that it is a central damage this is another way what we have mentioned this is called spin that is onset position intensity nausea vomiting nystagmus hearing loss duration and cns sign we already mentioned in previous one you can have a pause and you can go through at your leisure time. There are little more differences which are being mentioned here. That is direction of nystagmus, unidirectional very commonly in peripheral, while bidirectional is more common in central. Horizontal nystagmus purely in case of peripheral, while in case of a central, more commonly it is vertical or rotatory. Then Usually vertical nystagmus are never present in peripheral. They are invariably present in central variety. Visual fixation inhibits the nystagmus and vertigo. While there is no inhibition on visual fixation. Duration of the symptom is for a very short period. While this is for a very long period. Usually for days, weeks and sometimes even for months. Tinnitus usually present but may be unilateral. While usually we don't come across the tinnitus and unilateral deafness. It is not a common symptoms and signs. Associated CNS abnormality is more common in a central rather than peripheral. If you want to differentiate the different groups from what I go etc. And whether it is peripheral or central, ear examination is absolutely necessary. Tuning fork test, that is Rhinase and Weber's test is important. Cranial nerve examinations, sensory motor signs, look for nystagmus and perform Dick's helpic maneuver. 
and that will help you to differentiate BPPV from other groups. So all this examination will tell you if involvement of the cranial nerves, sensory system, motor science, that is more in favor of a central vertigo. And if there is a vertical nystagmus, continuous nystagmus, it is again more in favor of a central groups. So that will be there. And tuning fork test will help you to differentiate between conductive deafness or peripheral deafness or we call as a neuronal deafness. And if there is any ear finding like tympanic membrane abnormality, ear discharge, etc., it will favor peripheral vertigo rather than central vertigo. So you do a finger test, fistula test, head sucking test, rhombuck test, pass pointing test, underburger stepping test, or you can go for rhombuck gait test, Dix helpic maneuver. All these are important to differentiate between different varieties of vertigos central or peripheral finger nose test tandem walking fukuda test or you can go for again pass pointing rhombuck test tandem walking these are all important to find out ataxia also central groups central groups because they can produce ataxia also because if there is a damage to cerebellar you will have a cerebellar ataxia nystagmography is also important you can test for cranial nerves, different cranial nerves by doing a good CNS examination. Autoscope examination, that is ear examination, Weber's test, Rhinus test, to differentiate between conductive deafness and peripheral deafness, or we call a sensory neuronal deafness. I'm not going into detail regarding, because Rhinus test, normal Rhinus test, air conduction is better than bone conduction, that is normal. And you go through at your leisure time. Weber's test will help you to differentiate conductive deafness and neuronal deafness. You can go for audiometry. You can go for a brain imaging that is CT or MRI to find out the central causes. Or you can go for an electronistagmography that is ENG. You can go for a frenzel Gogol's test to rule out the non vertigo conditions like hypoglycemia you can go for blood glucose test hypoxia that is pulse oximetry pregnancy test you can go for eeg to rule out the cardiac arrhythmias you can go for an mri to rule out the central causes you can do an audiological evaluation to find out the conductive deafness whether it is a bone conduction deafness or a neuronal conductive deafness etc by and large, we divide into four groups, what I go, pre-syncope, disequilibrium, and we call psychogenic groups. And that is step one, step two, step three, what we call. In Once you confirm that there is a what I go, then you want to differentiate between a central and peripheral what I go. That is, we call a vestibular and peripheral what I go, central what I go. You will have a focal symptoms and signs. You can do a BPPV maneuver to, or a Apple maneuver to find out the BPPV. In Meniere's disease, you can find out certain findings, particularly the conductive deafness gradually increasing. Old age, person will constantly have a tinnitus and what I go. In labyrinthitis, it will be usually following what we call as a upper respiratory tract infections. In a central causes, usually go for a CT or MRI to find out the intracranial damage. In a pre syncope groups, you can go for an ECG examination, halter monitoring, or you can go for an external loop recorder, tilt table test, sinus massage, sensitive carotid sinus massage, or you can go for a stress test, eco, electrophysiological study, etc depending upon whether it is already on an eco you demonstrate there is a sick heart stress test eco loop recorder and eps while in a normal heart you can go for a carotid sinus massage loop recorder or tilt table test these are some of the things which you can go in a case of a pre-syncope and syncope groups we'll be having further slides also in a ataxia group mainly neurological examination is very very useful in a light headacheness, 
usually it is provoked by hyperventilations and you can easily rule out this particular condition by observing also and person will have a vague complaints and get a good history of taking certain drugs if a person comes to you with a temporary loss of consciousness then you have to rule out between syncope and non syncope groups and if there is no temporary loss of consciousness you don't have to worry for syncope groups so there are two groups which we divide there is a temporary loss of consciousness which can be because of syncope groups or because of non syncope groups in a non syncope groups epilepsy or seizures psychogenic and other we call as a which mimics epilepsy while in a syncope groups you will have to differentiate between a different groups you will have to differentiate between a different groups we will be dealing in a next slide so try to differentiate that and that can be done by good physical examination ecg and blood pressure record in a standing and supine will be you will be able to differentiate orthostatic hypotension this is the way we call non traumatic loc temporary loss of consciousness in a non traumatic comes a classical example of a syncope which can be orthostatic hypotension cardiac condition in a cardiac it can be cardiac arrhythmias it can be because of structural heart disease or because of orthostatic hypotension or it can be because of vasovagal syncope if it is due to head trauma then you don't have to differentiate at all straight forward it goes for the head trauma in a non traumatic group another group is epileptic seizures which can be gtc generalized tonic clonic pure tonic clonic or maybe a tonic variety or psychogenic groups particularly psychogenic pseudo syncopes or psychogenic non epileptic seizures and rare conditions which can also have some time temporary loss of consciousness like subclavian still syndrome vertebro basilar artery tia subarachnoid hemorrhage cyanotic spells rare conditions but you have to keep it in mind that will be very common in a children cyanotic spells as far as the syncope group is concerned mainly they are divided into this four plus fifth group we call as psychogenic groups or we call non syncope or syncope mimics in a neurally mediated vasovagal situational syncope carotid sinus hypersensitivity as far as cardiac arrhythmia is concerned sick sinus syndrome av blocks paroxysmal or supraventricular tachycardia long qt short qt brugada etc in structural heart disease aortic stenosis hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy pericardial tamponades while in case of orthostatic hypotension very frequently it is because of medications particularly anti hypertensive drugs drug use for bph we call alpha blockers or maybe because of volume depletions very frequently in a chronic diabetic with autonomic neuropathy parkinson disease or maybe very rare conditions like primary autonomic failure or once in a while in a case of endocrine disorders like addison's disease neurally mediated is accounting for almost 50% of the group while orthostatic cardiac arrhythmia and structural heart disease will be accounting for 55 to 60% of the groups and almost we say that good number of time we can't find out the cause that will be accounting for good time even you do all investigation still you can't identify maybe 35% but once you make a diagnosis this is accounting for a major groups well if you put this together they are also also accounting for another groups means out of 100 35 may be idiopathic or we don't know the cause 25% nearly will be neurally mediated 25% is this group 25 to 30% is this group and non cardiovascular groups we call non cardio this are non cardiovascular group maybe psychogenic or maybe metabolic disorders or maybe uh non cardiovascular non neuro limited groups we call syncope mimics can be drop attacks cataplexy 
TIA, pseudosynco, particularly psychogenic, or maybe because of metabolic disorders, epilepsy, intoxication by drugs, TIA, vertebrobasilar TIA, etc. They mimic syncopes. You have to keep it in mind. There are certain red flag signs. Whenever a person comes to you with temporary loss of consciousness, if it results in injury, yes, definitely it is syncope. After exercise, dangerous. In supine posture, syncope in supine posture, very, very dangerous. Suspected or a known case of structural heart disease. Identified by ECO or by other studies. If the person has got WPW, long QT, bundle branch block, heart rate less than 50, there are multiple poses, that is 6 sinus syndrome, Mobis type 1 or advanced heart blocks, documented tachyarrhythmias, myocardial infarction, these are all risky conditions. Family history of sudden cardiac death, particularly ARVD or we call Brugada syndromes, they are dangerous one. Frequent episodes or person is already on pacemaker or we call ICD, implantable cardiac devices, defibrillators. All these are dangerous. All person is having a risk occupation, particularly. Then also, advanced age is also a dangerous condition. If syncope occurs in an advanced age, it is a risky. So get a good history. Do a echocardiography to rule out a structural heart disease. ECG will tell you cardiac arrhythmias. If it is clearly identified by a cardiac ECG, identifies the cardiac arrhythmias, then you can decide regarding the treatment. If the answer is no, that there is no structural heart disease, no demonstration of cardiac arrhythmia, then go for tilt table test, carotid sinus massage or valsalva manure to identify what we call as a neurally mediated groups. While if there is a structural heart disease and ECG identifies, then you can go for a further studies. If it is not identifiable, you can go for a 24 hours monitor, ambulatory monitoring, or you can go for EP studies. You can go for a internal loop recorder, or you can go for even exercise induced. If a person is telling the person is having a syncope on exercise, etc. And then if all these reports are negative, then you can go again for ruling out what we call is a neuronally mediated groups. That is still table test carotid sinus massage, valsalva maneuver, or you can go for an internal loop recorder or external loop recorders. So whatever we have mentioned before, that you can go for. If you want to rule out central causes of vertigo, then you will have to go for a head scan, MRI, X-ray skull, brain scan, EEG, etc. This will be the group. This is for cardiovascular syncope, Alter monitor, external loop or internal loop record or tilt table test, eco, EPS study. And to rule out an endocrine evaluation, you can go for a endocrine assays. If you want to rule out a cardiovascular groups, angiogram, exercise test, and you can go for ECG. ENT evaluation can be done and psychological evaluation can be also done to rule out psychological conditions. These are all the tests which are being done in a person we already mentioned. These are some of the tests which will be very helpful. You can go, this is when a child is having a syncope, particularly you are suspecting aortic stenosis, coarctation of aorta. ECO and ECG is very helpful. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy also ECO is very helpful. ECO and ECG is helpful. Long QT, Again, ECG is very helpful. Pulmonary hypertension, RV hypertrophy you will get. In WPW syndrome, also you will be able to diagnose by ECG. And in coronary anomaly, you will have to undergo ECG as well as you will have to undergo coronary angiography. So that will be the way you can approach in the children. You should be able to differentiate between syncope and scissors. I'll just go through in a short inner scissors. Usually it will be at any time of the day. More common in a nocturnal. You will have an involuntary movement. You will have a pre aura is quite commonly present in a scissors. You will have a convulsive movements. You will have a epileptic cry, urinary incontinence, tongue biting, 
postictal confusion, headache, focal neurological symptoms and signs more common in a convulsive seizures rather than syncope. Cardiovascular finding will be very common in a cardiovascular syncope. Abnormal ECG will be seen also in a cardiovascular groups. While in case of a convulsive seizures, ECG will be normal. BPPV, we have already told you that person will have a rotational vertigo in a particular directions. It is very for very few seconds, does not last more than 30 seconds. There is no hearing loss, no other neurological symptoms and signs. And person might have a history of trauma before or ear infection before. That is quite common. And you can confirm it by Hills, Dix, Helpic Manoeuvre. Usually it is sudden onset, asymptomatic. Very frequently, classical BPPV is in an erect to supine posture at 45 degree. Person will complain of a rolling spin lasting for 20 to 30 seconds. Neurological examination is normal. Dick's helpic maneuver will prove it and caloric test will be normal. This is Dick's helpic maneuver which will be positive in case of a BPPV person will say that he is relieved of vertigo. And this should be done only by an expert. Don't try to attempt this particular test. In a menius disease, very frequently person will have a vertigo and tinnitus most common and person will have a associated hearing loss, mainly neuronal loss. And it is gradually progressive, gradually progressive in a particularly in an old age person. So we call a triad, vertigo, hearing disturbance and tinnitus, classical triad and accompanied by fullness, heaviness and commonly seen in an old age person. So this is a common difference between BPPV, Minius and psychogenic. At your leisure time, you can go through this particular and also regarding a central vertigo, the difference is being mentioned here. At your leisure time, you can go through. A small slide showing you some of the clinical history only can help you. Hearing disturbance, tinnitus, oral fullness, otalgia, otoria, more common inner ear. If there is a facial nerve palsy, seventh nerve is involved. In a CP angle tumor, very frequently it will be facial nerve with other findings like impaired facial sensations, clumsiness, dysarthria, and incoordination. This will be because of cerebellum involvement. And when there is a brainstem involvement, there is an altered level of consciousness, hemiplegia, hemiparesis, hemisensory loss, multiple cranial nerve palsy, dysarthria, dysphagia will be very common. Pure cerebellum involvement, incoordination and dysarthria will be very, very common. So some of this finding when you examine CNS, you can differentiate between all these groups. Treatment will depend upon the etiology, symptoms, Symptomatic treatment, you can have a rehabilitation therapy, you can go for prevention and physical conditioning exercises. Usually by and, by and large, a peripheral vertigo is very easily treatable and very easy to treat. Reassurance, patient educations and attend to any injury during a fall. In a BPPV, you can do a maneuver, we call Dix Helpic maneuver, or you can go for a Apple maneuver or Semont maneuver. In a labyrinthitic, go for rehabilitation. In Minius disease, low salt diet, diuretic surgery, and trans tympanic gentamicin you can use. In labyrinthitis, antibiotic, treat the infections, and vestibular rehabilitation. Vestibular neuronitis. Usually a short dose of high dose steroids, short course of high dose steroids and vestibular rehabilitation will be helpful. In a migraine, migraineous vertigo, beta blocker, calcium channel blocker will be helpful. In TIA, treat the basic conditions and antiplatelet agents and CP angle tumor surgery will be helpful. In a migraine, we have already told you that you will require the treatment. This is all what we have done before. 
so this is that slide what we have done so i'm skipping over there are some of the drugs which are very commonly utilized for peripheral vertigo we call as anticholinergic drug antihistaminic drugs and benzodiazepine now out of this whenever a person is having a severe vertigo promethazine antiemetics and diazepam is very useful while if a person is having nausea vomiting with vertigo prochlorperazine is very beneficial in a chronic recurrent vertigo meclizine is beneficial if we go through a simple way there are different materials which are available flunarazine beta histidine diazepam which is tranquilizer this is vasodilator this is ccb flunarazine is ccb and antihistaminic out of this a c and d produces sedation while beta histidine is a non sedative so that is preferred in a person who is active and who is doing a job work but others that is a c d are also beneficial in certain groups so don't think that beta histidine is the best all are equally good but beta histidine because of a non sedative effect it is preferred in certain groups these are the different drugs what are the doses you can use is mentioned here you can have a pause and you can have a look at that similar thing is also shown here anticholinergic drug antihistaminic antiemetics benzodiazepine ccb what are the doses indications advantages disadvantages all are mentioned here you can go through your lizard time have a pause and have a look this is apple manure this is dix helpic manure this is sarmant manure etc at the same time you should try to rule out ataxia also for ataxia person will complain of a disequilibrium recheck the medicines screen for neuropathy and neurological findings and consider the underlying conditions also and try to rule out parkinsons there are three common groups which can produce ataxia cerebellar ataxia vestibular ataxia and sensory ataxia here person will have a severe peripheral neuropathy here person will have a ear problems and this is very frequently because of the central causes i am not going into detail this is difference between cerebellar sensory and frontal ataxia and there is also an another group frontal extra pyramidal and cerebellar ataxia i am not going into detail regarding this if the person has got a pre synco then you will have to undergo a detail check up first rule out the orthostatic hypotension look for neuronally mediated syncopes and then for cardiovascular checkup light headache not giving a proper history does not fit with anything look for psychiatric groups and take a good psychiatric history so i end my lecture here and we'll be discussing on case discussion in your what we call is a live webinar so i will end my lecture here